groundbreaking ceremony for a new factory. Did she mention seeing anyone who was sick? Anyone on a plane at the airport? No, she said she was jet lagged. The average person touches their face three to five times every waking minute. In between, we're touching doorknobs, water fountains, and each other. Matt. Mom? No, no, uh, uh, go up to your room, honey. So we have a virus with no treatment protocol and no vaccine at this time. You had a seizure this morning, Beth. Yeah, she before? had a history of seizures. No, no, no. Allergies. No. As of last night, there were 32 cases. Unfortunately, she did die. He says, can I go talk to her? Mr. Amos, your wife is dead. What are you talking about? Okay. What happened to her? What happened to her? Is there any way someone could weaponize the bird flu? Is that what we're looking at? Someone doesn't have to weaponize the bird flu. The birds are doing that. Watch this. It's transmission, so we just need to know which direction. On day one, there were two people, and then four, and then 16. In three months, it's a billion. That's where we're headed. They're calling out the National Guard. They're moving the president underground. People will panic. Get away! It will tip over. The truth is being kept from the world. Cook your samples, destroy everything. Hello. I need you to get me the names of everyone who serviced this room. It's an emergency. You can't panic now. I know. I'm gonna get you home. I got people too, Dr. Cheever. We all do. Don't talk to anyone. Don't touch anyone. Stay away from other people. Get back in your car! We're not sick! It's figuring us out faster than we're figuring it out. It's mutate. Bem-vindos a mais uma sessão do Mês da Ciência e da Educação, uma iniciativa da Fundação Francisco Manuel dos Santos, comissariada pelo professor Carlos Filhais e pelo doutor David Marçal. Acabámos de ver imagens de um filme, Contagios, que em 2011 parece que era uma... uma profecia da situação que estamos a viver atualmente em todo o mundo. É uma pandemia provocada por um vírus. E este é precisamente o tema para a nossa sessão de hoje. Preparação para pandemias. Está comigo em estúdio, uh, with, me, with me I have Dr. Uh, Philip Freud, a physician, member of the Portuguese uh, National Task Force for COVID-19. And to help us reflect uh, uh, about this issue, we also invited Nahid Badelia, who is now joining us from Boston. Uh, hello, Dr. Nahid Badelia. Thanks for being with us. Uh, let me tell our, our viewers that uh, you are an infectious diseases physician, specialized in infection and control issues. Uh, you are a professor at Boston University School of Medicine and also medical director of the Special Pathogens Unit at Boston Medical Center. But uh, uh, better than me talking about you, please introduce yourself to our audience. Thank you so much. And it's an honor and a pleasure to be here today. Uh, the, I think the easiest way to describe what I do is I am a cross between Kate Winslet's character and Marion Cotillard's character in that movie. Work that I do focuses on helping hospitals. So I do a lot of, a uh, uh, majority of the work that I do is focused on emerging infectious diseases, diseases that we don't know that much about, diseases that spill over from animals into humans and we're learning about. And the focus that I have is how to train healthcare workers to be safe, how to discover drugs and vaccines and diagnostics that work and work with governments to make it safer. And over the last 15 years or so, I've worked as a frontline physician on a couple of different outbreaks, including H1N1 in New York City. In West Africa, I was a physician during the Ebola outbreak. Mm -hmm. And then in DRC Uganda, Ebola outbreak. And of course, as we're all involved right now in COVID-19. Okay, thank you. And now uh, I think you, you could uh, uh, share uh, with us your thoughts about this pr current pandemic, pandemic, uh, uh, pandemic uh, uh, And you have a presentation, if you please uh, uh, tell us what you think and uh, how you are following this, this issue. Great. So I have the clicker here. I am not able to see the slides uh, myself, so you'll have to... S oh, there we go. Yeah. Um, so uh, there, there it is. 
I, I wanted to talk a little bit about what we've learned, you know, in this very short period of time, I want to cover from my own experiences, but experiences of the world over the last 15 years, because we've seen um, this general trend where we're seeing new emerging infectious diseases. Um, we are we are discovering new pathogens that are with growing intensity jumping from animals into humans. In fact, two thirds of all the new infections that we've discovered in the last 40 years is something called zoonoses. They are diseases or infections or, or rather viruses that are uh, spilling over from other animals into humans. And the reasons those things are happening is because we as a species are growing. Um, in my lifespan, the population of the earth has doubled and we are ever more connected. In, in 2017, four billion people took a plane ride when SARS, the original SARS, occurred in China in, in 2001, 2002, what we saw was the virus was able to travel from Asia into North America and back to Asia within 72 hours. And that was almost 18 years ago. We're ever more connected. And not only that, but because we're a larger population, we are using the environment around us in other in different ways. We are encroaching on, on these very balanced environments between animals and, and pathogens that live amongst those animals. And when we walk into those areas, create farms where wetlands used to be, clear roads and forests, we then become exposed to pathogens, animals that carry these pathogens, and our domestic animals come in, in contact with those wild animals, which allows greater chances of these diseases to transmit over to humans. So both of those factors are increasing, but the other thing that's increasing is partly our ability to detect these viruses. Um, you know, it's been said by some estimates that there are more viruses on the face of the earth than there are stars in the sky. And the intensity with which we're discovering these viruses, and not all of them pose a potential risk to humans, but we don't know which ones, um, we don't have yet a handle of which ones are jumping into humans for the reasons I'm going to talk about in a second. Our technologies are getting better. We are realizing the virus that we thought was one virus is actually two because we're realizing more with more um, precision, you know, how to describe these pathogens. So, um, Here's, here's why it's been so hard to stop new, when you find a new emerging infectious disease, right? You say that a, a virus, similar to what you saw in the contagion in the movie, jumps from an animal into human. Why are we always so behind in stopping those new jumps from becoming outbreaks? So to require you to identify a new pathogen, once it crosses over from an animal into a human, you first need to have people realize that they're getting sick. In many cases, a virus can infect a person, particularly the first time it makes a spillover, it may not cause human disease. It may cause an infection, but it may be an asymptomatic infection. So it could be an infection that doesn't cause symptoms, but you, your body would develop antibodies towards it. And of course, if this happens in very remote parts of the world, we would never know. And that's why some of the work that's currently being done is looking at viruses that are circulating in animals and then testing humans in those areas to see if we're discovering that their um, immune memory shows exposure to new viruses. So if patients don't know that they're sick, and of course, this is one of the issues that we have, unfortunately, also with COVID-19, um, a lot of people don't know that they have the disease and they can still transmit it, then it's hard to, uh, keep, to keep an outbreak from becoming an epidemic. The other is people have to be able to get to care if they're sick, you know, and the disease has very common symptoms. And this was certainly the case for Ebola, for example, early symptoms of even Ebola virus disease look like a lot of other co-circulating infections, fever, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. That's a lot of other infections. They very much look similar. And if you're someone who lives in a remote community and you think you have these symptoms, you may just think you have malaria. In fact, there are studies, you know, up until 2014 that said that 60% of malaria cases in the world were, were treated before, without being diagnosed. So people would come in, have these symptoms, would get a malaria medication, would go home. If they don't get better, then they come back again. But that's the period of time that they may have spread whatever they have if it's a new disease to other people. And so what becomes important is that they walk into clinical care, that there is care close to where they live. And then when they get to care, clinicians recognize that this disease looks like something different. It's not malaria. And in the case of COVID, of course, when the flu season is coming up, the question that many clinicians around the world will have to ask is, well, is this influenza or is it is it COVID-19? And of course, the only way 
to tell the two apart, you know, there's very, very much a lot of similarities, uh, except for things like loss of sense of smell and taste that make the two very hard to tell. You require diagnostic tests. And in many resource limited settings in the world where we're seeing some of the spillovers happen, um, there aren't even basic laboratory tests available, let alone more, uh, more sophisticated tests that might help you identify a new pathogen or a rarer pathogen. And, and so this has been sort of work for the last 15 years that I think a lot of global partners that I'll, I'll talk about shortly have been working on. How do you in- increase our ability to diagnose diseases that are novel, that are different from just the endemic infections that are happening much more quickly. And one thing is to ensure that there is laboratory capacity in many more countries and that those laboratory capacities are linked to public health systems that are uh, quick to pick up those threats, quick to respond to them, have the resources uh, to report up the threat. And then once the threat is reported up to respond with the appropriate resources for infection control, for providing personal protective equipment, for isolating patients quickly. Um, and and when, when it's one or two patients, it may be easy to do, but you can see now with the example of COVID-19, when it's a virus that causes many, many more people to get sick, systems, systems can get very quickly overwhelmed. And then lastly, you require international partners to respond uh, because of many reasons that we talked about, but we require partnerships to ensure that potentially these threats do not cross borders. But even when they're within borders, that when countries do not have the resources that they need, uh, they're able to provide that. And one way that we do that on the international stage is something called the International Health Regulations. The WHO um, helps uphold this international agreement between really almost all the countries of the world that says that countries agree to tell each other when there is a threat and within 48 hours respond that up to WHO and make efforts to control that threat. Um, the, the problem t- so far has been at the at the terminal end, right? So if this is the way we surveil for new diseases, at the terminal end, at the first step, there are communities around the world that don't have access to care. And so we live in a world that might have outbreaks that we often miss. We might have outbreaks for a new pathogen that we may be missing today and we may not know about them. And it may not be until that becomes the pathogen becomes smarter, develops more human disease, forms more clusters, uh, that we may actually end up discovering that, that, that there has been a spillover. And that's what makes it so hard. Um, so the, the things that make it, in particular, you know, it's hard to control many and most infections. But the things that make emerging infectious diseases very hard to control are because we're learning about them. As you as you very rightly heard Kate Winslet say in that movie trailer, the scientific knowledge about a pathogen when we are responding to a new virus is growing as we move farther from the event of spillover. And the tough part about this is that what you need in those settings to get an idea of who has the disease, you first need to understand what that disease looks like. You know, what is your case definition? And so that gets built the minute you discover pathogen. You then need to have diagnostics to say, well, how many people have this disease? How quickly is this spreading? The tough part with emerging infectious diseases is that we need to build those molecular tests based on the, diagno- on, the, on, the, on the genetic material of the virus itself, which is why it's so important when new pathogens are, are discovered that there is sharing among countries um, on that genetic sequence so that tests can be built. We also don't have treatment as opposed to, let's say, you know, um, another pathogen that we may have, may have a vaccine for. There are no vaccines, there are no therapeutics, which makes control so much harder. It requires very blunt instruments such as, you know, dividing, keeping people apart, quarantining people who've been exposed, isolating people who are sick. And then the other part of this is that it, it's, 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 a, it's emerging infectious diseases require us to balance research with clinical care. We need to be learning about the disease because what we learn from those first hundred patients about how the disease plays out, about what's happening in their body, about how their immune system's responding, helps us build the tools to help the next hundred patients. So the tough part, as you can see, is that there is a balance and there is the ethics of actually doing research. The research is so important to do because that's how we become smarter in battling these diseases. But then the resources needed for this research are not always available at the site of where the response is happening. And this has been particularly true in, in responses that I've been part of. So this is a photo from, from one of my uh, 
one, one of the Ebola treatment units that I worked with, um, all these photos are taken with permission, of course, with patients, um, where where you can sort of see the lack of the, the ma- most basic resources, right? And if, if, if you don't have basic resources for clinical care, it's very hard to balance doing research at the same time if there are not enough people in the field. So this has been a discovery, at least for many of the outbreaks that are happening in resource-limited settings. The third part, and this has been very true, I'm sure, as you know, with with COVID-19 as well, is that because you're learning about the pathogen, you have to evolve public policy with the change in scientific knowledge. And this can be very confusing for the larger public because on the outside, it seems that people in public health are changing their minds. And and in reality, what's happening is science is adapting as more data comes out. And, And unfortunately, what that requires then is looking back and readjusting our public policy, public health policy, to make sure that it's what's keeping people safest. A perfect example in COVID, of course, is is the the discovery that patients who are asymptomatic or patients who do not have symptoms can still transmit the disease. As you remember, because we didn't know that early on, there wasn't as much focus on use of masks. And once that was discovered, there was this big change which left a lot of people confused. And that happens in a lot of different settings and in, in that, that's happened in West Africa, you know, in terms of the personal protective equipment to, to use. Um, so what, what has happened right before COVID? Right before COVID hit, from the experiences of H1N1, from the experience of the 2013 to 2016 West African Ebola epidemic, from the experiences of the 2018 DRC outbreak of Ebola virus disease, a few different organizations have been created. The recognition was made that even though this international health regulations uh, are are required, that what people are where countries are required to do is to detect, uh, surveil, detect, and respond to these pathogens. Only twenty percent of the world's countries have the capacity to do all the things that international health regulations require them to do. And so, in the aftermath of West Africa, this this coalition called the Global Health Security Agenda, which is a coalition of about sixty nine countries, private organizations, academic institutions, was created to help increase that capacity in countries around the world by increasing laboratory capacity, by workforce training, by increasing vaccination rates, by increasing detection of antibiotic resistance, which is, of course, another infectious diseases threat. Um, and the, they have made, you know, they had in the last eight years or so, or a little less, six years or so, they have made some um, some advances. The other big advances that have happened is that WHO uh, came up with something called the research and Diagno- the research and development blueprint uh, for preventing uh, epidemics. What the WHO did with member countries is come up with a list of pathogens, you know, priority pathogens that we, the world needs to work on, on that we know right now that have the potential, have not caused big outbreaks, but have the potential to make big outbreaks because they're already being seen to, to make smaller local outbreaks occur. So given the connectivity, they foresee that these are viruses that might become bigger global threats. So that R&D blueprint has been used by institutions, by, by governments to sort of work on those pathogens. And the kind of pathogens that are on there are av- avian influenza, viral hemorrhagic fevers, um, and other bacterial pathogens as well. The third big effort that happened after 2014 is something called the Coalition of Epidemic Preparedness and Innovations. That is a coalition of, of companies and countries that put a lot of money together to say, okay, which are the top three pathogens that we need to give money for right now and put investment in to develop vaccines and diagnostics for? And, and so what they recognized for the first cycle were Lassa fever, MERS virus, uh, which is, of course, another coronavirus, and, and Nipah virus. And they, they have been working with companies and institutions and in, investigators to develop vaccines and diagnostics for those pathogens. And then there will be another cycle that then focuses on other pathogens as well. So I'm going to end... Um, with oops I, I see that the we're missing we're missing the main part which is the which is the uh which is the lessons from covid so what have we what have what has covid done what has covid taught us so despite all the lessons that we learned from prior pathogens covid has revealed new weaknesses in our system and here are the weaknesses First, we realize that you know when it's when it's an outbreak in one place, it's much easier to handle that because you can bring supplies from other places. But when the outbreak, when the pandemic is occurring everywhere, global supply chains for things like diagnostics, reagents, personal protective equipment, 
cannot stand the strain. As you know, all countries, almost all countries still are, 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 are experiencing shortages in medical equipment, medications, personal protective equipment. And as we walk into a potential second wave of COVID-19, it really reveals how vulnerable we are from that perspective. The second thing we've discovered is that we need to work together to come up with generating data about efficacy of drugs uh, as a world. You know, as, as you might discover, each country is holding its own trials, but some of the biggest results have come from global collaborations of large trials that have evaluated medical countermeasures or treatments uh, that has allowed a quicker evaluation of what works and what doesn't work so that doctors and nurses know what to employ. The third thing we've discovered um, is that we we still have a long way to go in, in separating politics and, and pandemic response. You know, in many countries, what we've seen is that this population division and, 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 and our, my own country of the United States, you may be aware of this, there's a lot of uh, political division in the way this pandemic is viewed. And so when we move forward and we face the rest of this pandemic and the next one, how do we ensure um, that we can, we can have a science-based, population-based sort of strategy and keep politics out of that? The last thing is that we, as a world, it's in everybody's, um, it is in, in, in everybody's um, benefit when there is a vaccine, when there is a therapeutic, you know, uh, to, to have it be equitably distributed throughout the world. This is where national, vaccine nationalism does not work. The reason why is because um, if there's an outbreak somewhere else in the world, once we open our borders, we're going to be affected again, right? We, we, none of the vaccines we currently have, candidates we have, show the, the chances of having complete uh, immunity. Most of them may be 50, 60% efficacious, we think, we don't yet know, which means that there might still be a chance that people, even after they get a vaccine down the road, the immunity may wane. And if that's the case, making sure the whole world gets vaccinated is the one way that we move forward. And so efforts like WHO's COVAX, which is a large multinational effort to try to get vaccines to all the countries that need it, are an important step to making sure that we get past this pandemic. Here's the last lesson that I, I wanted to say. This is something that I posted a while ago. You know, I've been reflecting on the fact of why it's so hard to get beyond this pandemic. It, in some ways, even though we don't have, you know, very good treatments, we have some smaller efficacious treatments like remdesivir and, and steroids that we use in the hospital to help decrease inflammation in patients who are very sick. Um, why is it hard, especially in my country, to get people to wear masks to keep that distance? And, and I think one of the troubles with a disease like COVID-19 is that it's not like Ebola, right? It's not like Ebola virus disease that has a very high mortality. It's very obvious to see. And it's not like the common cold, which is even if it spreads widely, you know, most of the people, uh, majority of the people who get it, are they're not going to overwhelm the system. COVID is somewhere in between where it gets people sick enough so that it, if you let it just go, it will overwhelm the healthcare systems. But on the other hand, it's not so sick and there are people who, who get this disease who never have any symptoms. And so for them, they don't understand why they have to wear this mask and keep that distance. And so the trouble, I think, the issue with handling a pandemic like COVID-19 is that society doesn't know how to handle the risk that takes, you know, does nothing to some people and risks killing others. And, and, and so it's really sort of a, a challenge of how do we work together as society, knowing that if the risk, even if the risk is not to us, it may be to people we don't see because we may be passing on the disease without realizing. So I'll end there. Um, and, and thank you for the, letting me make the remarks. Okay, thank you. This was a really interesting uh, presentation and uh, many points very interesting. For example, we, we will try to touch some of them. We don't, will not have time to, to touch everything. But uh, I could perhaps ask you, Dr. Uh, Philippe Freus, for a first comment about this, uh, these ideas that uh, uh, Professor uh, shared with us. First of all, thank you for sharing with us this fantastic uh, presentation. Sometimes the simple things are the most effect effective things. And before I forget, a disclosure, my English is not as good as my Portuguese, because <laughs> I speak much better the Portuguese than the English I'm speaking now. <laughs> But, I speak no Portuguese, so you have a one up on me. You're much better off than I. Probably we speak more languages than the English. For example, I work in France, so I can speak <laughs> French, by the way. But I, I think we can uh, easily see two we easily see two main conclusions for your presentation. First, we are facing a, a global threat. We need to act 
globally. We need global coordination. We need no, no country alone is able to defeat a pandemic. We need to act together. So I think pandemics are a, a proof how we need to work together and to share knowledge with each other countries. And we, we in Europe, for example, we have European Union. One of the problems we are facing now, for example, is the difference between approaches against COVID in different countries in Europe. This is not good for us to explain for the Portuguese people, for example, why in some other countries in Europe they are not doing the same or they are diff uh, doing different things. This is noise and this is not good to act together to fight the same enemy. So working together to face a global uh, uh, threat. And second, and most importantly, knowledge. We cannot do nothing without knowledge. And I think you stressed that very well. We need knowledge to diagnose, to see the patients, to have diagnostic PCR, to diagnose the, the, the bug. To, 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 we, need diagnose, we need knowledge for new therapeutics. We need diagnostic to explain people how to address this threat because we need to engage people and the best way to engage people is with knowledge with knowledge so i think thank you very much for for sharing with with us this uh, fantastic presentation and two words from there global we need to act together and knowledge two strong words uh, Dr. Nahid, you, you mentioned uh, uh, that uh, uh, about about this coalition for epidemic preparedness, uh, we are we have more knowledge than than we had uh, previously. But based on previous knowledge, shouldn't we have been more prepared uh, to deal with this pandemic? Because we have pandemics. Uh, uh, for instance, a flu, flu, uh, Spanish flu, for instance, and uh, some things we see now are similar, but it seems that we didn't learn anything from, from there. How, how is that possible? And do you think that this time it will be okay, we will be more prepared for future pandemics? Oh yeah, I uh, even before COVID-19, I, I think every time we went, walked into outbreaks, we said the same thing, you know? And, and so the answer, unfortunately, is um, because we forget, you know, uh, we live in a culture of outbreak response and not outbreak preparedness. We go through, if somebody said, someone smarter than me said this, and I can't remember who said it, we live in cycles of panic and neglect. We, we basically, when we, when there is an outbreak, there's a lot of political, you know, pressure to put funding into making, uh, standing up the system, such as creating resources in hospitals, creating public education, training healthcare workers, putting money in research. And when there is no outbreak, you can take the example of my country itself. There was a lot of money put in global health security. And as, as we saw, even we, the, uh, we left 2014 Ebola epidemic, you know, money from for work that was dedicated to finding answers, answers to that was shifted to Zika. New money wasn't assigned to that. And then when the new administration came, they completely dismantled global health security. And so the, a lot of times it's related to funding. And that funding, unfortunately, is related to political cycle. And the best thing that I can say is that if we as the public can keep the pressure to say that this is an important part that needs to be continued to be funded, that is the only way forward. There's so many programs that I've been part of which have lost funding eventually over time because governments are no longer interested. The one thing that I do think that might change after this, you know, I, I in 2015, I was doing a training with the Taiwanese CDC and uh, I was having conversations with many of, of the people who had gone through SARS in those countries. And what they said was, you know, there was this memory, population memory, um, among people who had gone through what happened after SARS and in, in certain countries that have gone through this widespread threat, uh, they have changed their institutions and they've changed the public's understanding of a pathogen and how to respond to it has changed. The same thing, for example, has happened uh, in Uganda, another country I work in. You know, their prior experiences with recent experiences with Ebola helped them switch the resources that they had for emergency coordination, for um, you know, evaluation of new therapeutics to apply to COVID-19. It was an easy switch to make because they already had the infrastructure and recent institutional memory. So I'm hoping that we, we learn from that and realize that we now live in the age of pandemics.
We, 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 of course, we, we, may, we may now say that uh, uh, this is not only a, an health issue. We, we, it's social, psychological, economic, political, uh, both causes and consequences. You were talking about a consequence. A Pro, a possible con uh, consequence is more money for 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 uh, for research. We hope that it will it will happen. But uh, anyway, you said recently uh, something like the coronavirus is said to be the third leading cause of death before the end of the year. Do you still uh, uh, keep this this, uh, or is it worse than you you thought when you said this? How will this evolve? Well, it is. It's already the third leading cause of death in the United States. It's not the, the it's not yet, you know, if you look at, we're not at the end of the year. And when you look at the number of people who have died of coronavirus in the U.S. is what I meant. Uh, we've already passed that. And, and, you know, of course, there's trouble understanding also that we don't have a good picture for the rest of the world, how many people have died, because you may know of this term called excess, uh, excess mortality. So excess mortality is this idea that we have a sense every month of every year, generally compared to last year or the year before, how many people we expect to die of the diseases, regular diseases that we have, both infectious and non-infectious. When you see this increase in deaths, we wonder what that increase is from. A portion of that this year, of course, is from coronaviruses. But what we're discovering is that there's a whole other portion that we can't explain that's not from coronaviruses. And likelihood of that is in that unexplained group are people who wear coronavirus patients, you know, COVID-19 patients that weren't diagnosed. It's probably also people because of the pandemic who are not able to get care or who, because of the overwhelming of some systems or because, you know, vaccinations can't be distributed globally as, as they should be or outbreaks have occurred, other reasons that are secondary effects of, of pandemics. And we don't have a handle of, of that. We say you might have heard that we passed one million deaths of coronavirus recently globally. I think it's higher than that. I think the death toll is already higher than that. Okay. Uh, yes. Just, yes. Just to my knowledge, you you said in the United States coronavirus is the third cause of death. What are the first and the second? Cardiovascular diseases. Yes, uh, I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but if I were to guess, I'm guessing it's stroke and heart attack. Yeah, stroke and heart attack. Yes. In Portugal, we don't have that those figures, because uh, we. We, we, we change our capacity to COVID patients, but we don't, our mortality in, uh, from COVID in Portugal is lower than 2,000 patients. It's almost 2,000 patients, but we have a, a problem. We, people are dying from other causes because our resources are going to COVID. And it's difficult to explain to people if we don't address the resources in COVID, all the others, COVID and non-COVID, will be affected. So people, we need to balance COVID patients and non-COVID patients. And just to address the history about pandemics, it's a, a major issue in my formation. Probably the first pandemic was described by Hippocrates, the, the father of the medicine in Greek, in the fifth century before Christ. So we, what is the meaning of this? Pandemics are part of the history of mankind. This is not a black swan event, an highly improbable event. The, the, main, uh, the only uncertainty about the pandemic is when it's going to happen. Because in the last 100 years, this is the fifth time. Since I'm a doctor, this is the second time. And since I'm alive, this is the third time we have a pandemic. Uh, more and more, more and more uh, pathogens, as you as you uh, mentioned, are crossing species borders, uh, coming to, to to humans, affecting humans. So, uh, how is it possible to use the knowledge we have to deal with new pandemics? I mean, it is more uh, about how we deal with it. For instance, in, in, in terms of, of health policies, or is it uh, because if we don't know the new pathogens, how can we develop vaccines or, or, or treatments? Uh, great points. I, I do want to address what the doctor just said, which was, you know, uh, the likelihood that spillovers, uh, spillovers will happen and pandemics might occur. We live in an age of pandemic. And so what it requires for us to build resilience into our communities, you know, is, is because a, 
an ounce of prevention is is worth so much more. If we had these systems into place, maybe we could have caught this disease before it became so globally spread. You know, and, and so it's building it's building resilience that keeps hazards from becoming disasters. Um, so, in in, in in your question is 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 more leading to how do we reduce the hazards themselves? And there are some efforts. So. Um, First and foremost, there are efforts such as the Global Virome Project, which basically does a, a review of what I said, which is scanning both viruses that are circulating among among animals that are in close proximity to humans, you know, among sort of many of the very biodiverse rich areas in the world where we see potentially transmissions occurring. Um, and then there are others that are working on sort of evaluating the spillover part into humans. That part is a bit weaker because health systems everywhere are very different. Projects like the Global Virome Project can help us identify those pathogens that have similar homology, you know, have similar sort of sequences to others that have crossed over and caused human diseases. You know, for example, even the work around bat coronaviruses has expanded. So bat coronaviruses like the one like SARS-CoV-2 is thought to be um, there's a bunch of you know, viruses in that family that have the propensity to potentially evolve to cause human disease. So that's one part of it. The, the other way we do this is to actually build the system so that, you know, for example, one thing would be diagnostic um, diagnostic platforms that are easily, you know, you can adapt from one disease to another. And, and certainly molecular diagnostic uh, platforms have gotten much better. You can plug in genetic material and create diagnostic tests much easier. Same thing with vaccine platforms. There's a lot of investment that's now being made on novel vaccine platforms that help understand what are parts of entire families of viruses that are very similar so that you could create vaccines that are against a common element that doesn't change between, you know, so for example, the universal flu vaccine is an example of, of what the efforts that we're working on. So even if there are other influenza, you know, potentially uh, pandemic influenzas that come out, if we discover ways to create um, greater conserved um, protectiveness from vaccines that are universal, we could be potentially be protecting our population against a whole range of viruses that haven't made the jump. So those are some efforts, research efforts. And of course, the way we improve the rest of the system is um, to make our healthcare systems more resilient and to educate our public on how to continue to take simple measures. You know, this may not be true in Portugal, but in the U.S., we've become so comfortable about sending people who are sick to work. It was this badge of honor. I'm sick. I'm still coming to work. And 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 that's think about it now. If you if you have people who are sick going in with COVID, imagine other people that they're making sick. What one of the things that I hope we do after this pandemic is, as a population, learn the importance of reducing um, those those types of risks within our population. One of the lessons, when you mentioned the lesson, lessons from COVID-19, one of the conclusions is pandemic response is too vulnerable to political interference. I would like to, to, to hear you about uh, another kind of interference is uh, everybody specialist. We, we see many people who are not specialists, but they go on the media and they write on, on the uh, social media and so and they, they they say things that perhaps are worse than, than, than they should. How, how do you look at this uh, fake news and, and everybody is a specialist? Yeah, that's a tough one, right? Because on the one hand, you know, the argument that people make is this is a brand new virus. There are no specialists. True, but there are definitely people who've worked on viruses, on, on pandemics for a very long time, who understand common things that can go wrong, right? Such as if you start making claims that are wrong, you may create public panic and that might, re, you know, end up with more harm. Um, it, it, that's definitely been an issue in, in this part. I do think that because it is a virus and there are new, new virus, there are new perspectives that could be obtained from other disciplines. I, I do worry about this trend. You know, we need what's happened in my country is that we don't hear enough from our CDC scientists. You know, um, we don't hear from our public health folks that are part of the government and as much. And that's the political interference part. And because those voices, those very authoritative voices are gone, it creates this vacuum, which is then filled in by everybody and their mother, you know, who's who wants to wants to be up front. And, and then there are other phenomena is if you're in social media, you're an expert. But I plenty 
most of the experts in my field are not on social media. And so how do we make sure the voices of the truly people who've been working on this um, to more more accessible to people? I mean, I think that's one effort is to make uh, voices of those who have been working on this for a very long time more accessible on social media, on more accessible sort of channels that public can take advantage of. Um, I do think that my experience in this this you know particular pandemic, and so I, I did a lot of public education during Ebola, you know, and I did a lot of public education during H one N one, and 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 always I depended to go back to the government sources, the CDC scientists, and I, I really do hope that we start hearing more from that because that unifying voice makes a difference. That's how you suck the air out of all the nefarious actors and, you know, people who don't particularly have the expertise is by having one or two really strong, you know, authoritarian uh, uh, voices with authority. Of course, we know that researchers do research. It's their focus. But do, do you think they should also uh, see this, this, the need to, to go to the public, to go public uh, as, as a kind of a social responsibility? Yeah, so this has been this has been a bit tough because you know this plays out in a couple of ways. Um, I I actually think that one of the big issues in other uh, you know so West Africa epidemic is a perfect example. You know, there was a lot of times that we felt that it was important to get knowledge out quickly. There there because there was a lag when you know I was taking care of patients. You know. Um, in, in, in August 2014 and November 2014, when I was seeing a lot of patients in UTUs, we were observing, or Ebola treatment units, we were observing that a lot of patients had um, central nervous system issues, you know, and, and that had never been reported with or hadn't been widely reported with Ebola virus disease. And then we were discovering people who had survived who were still having symptoms. And that, of course, led to the discovery of something called post-Ebola virus disease syndrome. So this, this discoveries that we were making, it was so important to try to sort of get that um, out so that other people can sort of help identify that, right? And, and so a lot of conversation coming out of those outbreaks was how do we make knowledge more quickly accessible so that other researchers can build off of that? But one way that we've handled it in this pandemic is something called preprints, which is um, this web servers that allow research to submit researchers to submit um, their their findings. And, and the, the advantage of this is that allows new good findings to be available more quickly so other people can start working on it before, you know, before the article has to go through peer review for evaluation by the journal. The trouble then is, of course, it's not yet evaluated by peer review and by the journal. And so a lot of bad science makes its way up on the preprint service as well. And it's the same thing with social media and other things where sometimes you see a lot of bad science also on that. And it gets a lot of attention because the public is paying attention. It's a very difficult dilemma that, you know, I... To, to date, the only thing I can think of is that, you know, we can't, we just have to educate the public more and, and we need to have faster turnaround times on journals and peer review. Uh, and we need to have media be more responsible about what they cover to really augment the voices and findings that are more reliable rather than sensational. Uh, just, just two or three comments about the things you are saying. Do you know, the way we see what's going on in the United States, it's easy to say, all resources, no coordination. You have all the resources in the world and you lack coordination. <laughs> so true. But the problem is we need global interaction. So when you don't have a good coordination, a good communication, a good science, all other countries are are weakened by your lack of coordination because we need good examples. And most of the times, in scientific terms, United States is a solid and good example. And now we lost your example and things are getting harder because you have no good coordination and so social media, the fake news are increasing because we lack good scientific communication, good examples from United States. And the, the story of pandemic is not a problem from now, our days. For example, the German philosopher Friedrich Hegel wrote that the only thing we learn from history is we don't learn nothing from history. <laughs> it's the main <laughs> conclusion of Hegel. And by the way, in 1947, the French writer Albert Camus wrote, by the way, I don't know if you have already written, uh, read it, the, the plague 
It's a book from 1947, The Plague. It's a plague in a city in Argelia, north of Africa, and is affecting everybody. And the, the, in the end, the doctor who is dealing with facing the problem and treating the patients, Dr. Rie, is asked what is the best way to deal this, this, this plague. And he, he answers, the only way to face this plague is working with decency, decency, honesty, decency. And decency means for him is each one doing his job. So if you are not epidemiologist, don't lose time with epidemio epidemiological opinions to others. If you, are, if you are not a virologist, leave virology to virologists. So, and this is a problem from ancient times. This is not a problem of our days. So every time we have a pandemic, we, have, we are facing this problem. Uh, but now the problem is bigger because we lost United States example, good example, and the good academia from United States. Yes. Yeah, I, I must say, you know, one of my favorite books, because, of course, it is underlying a lot of the work that I do over the I've done over the last couple of decades. And a great uh, another quote from that book is in this world, there is there is pestilence and there are victims. And to the best of our ability, we must not be on the side of pestilence. And, and that that is exactly what you were saying, which is it is not just about the sharing the knowledge, but we as a humanity have to make a commitment to be on the side of humanity and not be on the side of pestilence. And that's the best side of humanity. Yes, but, but uh, um, let me introduce a, a different point of view <laughs> <laughs> about that. Um, Science is multidisciplinary to nowadays, and we have, uh, I already mentioned this, economic consequences, social consequences. You, for instance, uh, uh, you, do, you do research in uh, uh, infectious, infections, and uh, you are a doctor, medicine doctor, uh, so you, you do that, that link between, between research and clinical care, as you mentioned. But do you also uh, deal with the sociologists and the econ economists? Because this deals with other fields of, of, of knowledge. How is it? Uh, do you see? How do you see these these links with other areas uh, of knowledge? Well, as the the best advice was just given, I, I tend to not comment on things that are related to economy, except for what I read from other scholars that I respect. You know, you know, the the tough part of this is uh, pandemics have costs. You know, I, I think what we've missed in this is, is it's not the public health measures that are causing this. You know, it's not the governments that are imposing the measures that are causing these economic losses. It is the pandemic a pandemic that none of us asked for, a pandemic that none of us wanted, but that's what's happened. And then the path that everybody's trying to do is the, another word of the day, I think it's balance. You know, it's, it's finding this balance. Um, I, I definitely learn a lot from my colleagues in, in, in economic sciences and social sciences and, and even in subfields of public health that I'm not part of, including behavior change sciences. Uh, I'm on many panels and working groups. A lot of times the, the work that I do with governments tends to be multidisciplinary. You know, it's generally a large group of people who share um, issues from the same side. The things that I can advise on are my, my links very much are between uh, clinical work, laboratory evaluation. So my day job is I run a three bed biocontainment uh, patient care unit. So it's a patient care unit that's specialized to take care of patients with highly uh, communicable and dangerous diseases. And it backs up a laboratory, a maximum containment laboratory, uh, biosafety level four laboratory. So it, it's a national emerging infectious diseases labs. And it's a, vi it's a, vi it's a lab that does uh, research on viral hemorrhagic fevers and other biosafety level four pathogens. So in my work, it's very much focused on research, on biosafety, on medical care, on research, I'm sorry, on um, on uh, the diagnostics and therapeutics, but I learned so much from others in my community who talk about how do we communicate about the risk about these diseases. I learned so much from others. And so um, as, as far as we want people to stay in their field, I, I'm, I'm with you on the point that we need also input from many different 
uh, points. When he, and this is where political, true political leadership comes in. It is, is taking evidence from all these fields and, and, and striking that balance that is not one, completely one way or completely the other. Uh, Dr. Uh, Philip Frost, you are a member of the, the Portuguese National Task Force for COVID-19. In, in that task force, you have different uh, specialists, I mean, uh, I yeah, suppose. Yeah, we, we have different specialists, of course. Uh, we, we have virologists, clinicians, infectious diseases. I'm a pulmonologist, by the way, an intensive care physician. And we have two. Uh, we don't have economical uh, advice to the government, of mm. course. They have economists for uh, sharing this opinion with them. We have to help the government to decide, for example, when to use the texts, for example, when to use remdesivir, when to use dexamethasone. We need to share the good practice to, to do the best for our patients. But sometimes we need to address the problem of costs. And I think we have two types of costs, the costs of doing and the costs of not doing. Both are costly. And most of the times, we need to see the costs as an investment in medium long term. And some people want immediate results. That's another problem sometimes we need to face. Immediate results are impossible and you need to have a strategy in medium long term to face a pandemic. Mm -hmm. um Another lesson you mentioned earlier, um, uh, Dr. Nahid, it was the, the, the responses, uh, uh, global, a global response. Uh, and we share knowledge, okay. But we know that poor, poor countries, uh, in, in the poorer countries, is more difficult. They are condemned not to have access to, 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 to some treatments and to some vaccines. Do you, do you feel comfortable no not do you think we, we can overcome that and uh, uh, um, for instance we see uh, uh, the united states criticizing uh, and blaming china for this for for for, for the, the pandemic uh, does it make sense instead of cooperation <laughs> <laughs> no i um you know as someone who's worked in the international field uh For outbreaks. I, I've worked, of course, on the U.S. side here for preparedness, but a lot of the work that I do has been in West Africa and in East Africa. And um, it is so easy to see global connectivity. I, I, too, mourn what we've done as a country. We have left the WHO and the um, U.S. played a very strong global role in, in, in providing CDC provided a lot of guidelines. There was a lot of sort of interaction between WHO and CDC. CDC often served as the expert role in a lot of outbreaks elsewhere that WHO pulled CDC into, right? There were, it, it, it had that role, in, and by pulling that pulling out of the WHO, um, as, you know, as was mentioned, we have, we have hampered the global response. And, and the toughest part of this is, is the COVAX, you know, effort that I talked about, this global effort to get vaccines everywhere, including poor countries, because I think it is dependent on us to make sure that everybody gets this vaccine, because if this vaccine is not completely sterilizing, so for example, it's not completely, um, causing you to have an immunity that's long lasting, but also getting rid of the, the, the disease so that you don't get reinfected to the point where you're, you're still transmitting the virus. If that's the case, then people may still need to ensure that a huge portion of the world is, is vaccinated if we don't want to keep circulating the virus, right? China and the United States, two of the biggest economies in the world, have not contributed to COVAX. How can that be? How can we move forward and say that we want to reap advantages of, of having a globally immunized world and not make the investments necessary? And my only hope is that we as a country, um, that you know, our administration, whichever administration ends up being on the other side of November, um, makes this change immediately and goes back and then contributes to the global scene. Uh, in some countries we see, uh, all over the world, we see now uh, uh, more and more testing. Uh, they, uh, many countries are doing more and more testing. Is testing the, the, the solution? Is, is this the right, uh, right uh, way to... to, to uh... Yeah, I get asked that question. I, I think the, the answer is solution to what? Right? It's, 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 it's that if you, if the goal is to open up 
tons of schools. The goal is to try to return as well, you know, as close to back as normal to normal life until we have a vaccine. Then testing is important. Testing is one part of many things, right? If you just test, but you don't have the capacity to then find everybody else who was in contact with that person, the disease continues to transmit. So that's contact tracing and then isolating somebody who you found who has the disease. You know, yeah, testing is is the type of testing strategy we use has to be linked with how open we want to be as a society during this pandemic. If the goal is only to test people who are sick enough to get to the hospital, then you know it, it, it clearly makes sense that we have no idea what's going on in the community. And hence, our decision should be to try to keep the, the society as closed as possible and to not have that many social interactions because otherwise we're it's like a bucket with a hole. We're continuing to create cases in the community that will continue to keep to coming to the hospital and the number will keep going up, right? And so it depends on how open you want to keep society. The more open you want to keep society, the more tests you need and more places you need testing in. But the testing is just one part of a larger strategy. Uh, and then we have the vaccines and we, we can talk about vaccines and about treatment. In a, a timeline, what will come first, the, the vaccine or a treatment? So uh, I, I think that the timeline as it's sort of you know revealing itself we ha currently in the US have uh, or even in you know in the UK now there's three leading candidates we have the Pfizer candidate we have the Moderna candidate and we have the AstraZeneca with one more that's just entering uh, phase 3 trials and the and the thoughts from what we've heard from operation warp seed which is the US large US uh, group that's government group that's investing and working on this is that we may have if we identify that one of these vaccine candidates is effective, uh, then in the U.S. at least, we expect to have about 20 to 30 million doses by end of the year. But it is not until next summer that they're likely to, and then this is in the U.S. You said this is a country, by the way, which does have all the resources and no coordination. <laughs> so we will actually have to see even if next summer is realistic because, you know, the money for distribution doesn't exist. Currently, CDC says they need five to six billion dollars and HHS needs an additional 20 billion dollars to do that distribution. And that in our country, those resources haven't been allocated yet. Um, so if that's the case, I think that's we're not we're not going to be able to reach population herd immunity through vaccines, which is what we want. We don't want herd immunity through natural infections. We want it through the vaccine. That won't happen until fall of 2021. The likely treatments that might be coming on the market in the near term, um, the ones that are currently in clinical trials are something called monoclonal antibodies or antibodies that are uh, manufactured. That, that at first, they're taken uh, from survivors. They're studied to be the most effective of the proteins that are good at fighting the, the disease. And then they're taken and cloned many times over. And those monoclonal antibodies have, uh, there's just a study that came out, a small study that came out yesterday from Regeneron that said one of the monoclonal antibodies seems to show some ability to reduce the virus in patients who are outpatients. Again, a lot of time to go. I don't expect the results of those to come out until the end of the year. They may be a bridge which reduces the mortality of patients who are high risk, and they may reduce the chances potentially um, if they show efficacy also to be used in post-exposure prophylaxis. You know, people given the drug uh, before the, uh, right after they were exposed, it might reduce severe disease and in decrease mortality, which would be a bridge to get us to the vaccines. In, in uh, uh, March, April or so, mortality was uh, mainly uh, among elder people. Now, and uh, everybody thought, okay, the young, young people are okay, they are free from this. Now we are seeing that it's not, it's, uh, how will this, will this develop? Uh, why was that, what, what was that like that? And uh, how do you see that? Uh, is it for everybody? No one is safe from getting the, this disease? Yeah, great point. I, I think the one point to remember that is in the spring, the mortality was so high, partly because of who we were testing, because we were looking for mortality in people who were testing. And if you remember, there was such limited testing. We were only testing people who came to the hospital. And even then, even you know, here in Boston in March, if someone didn't have a travel history, we couldn't get a test on them. Oh. Um, and so if you're only testing the sickest, you know, and then you, you 
what we know is that people who are hospitalized are likely to have a higher mortality. So of course the mortality looks, you know, bigger. As we started testing more people, the mortality goes down because the denominator of the number of people who are confirmed with the disease goes up. And so that's one reason why mortality has gone down. The other is we have gotten better in taking care of these patients. The use of steroids, the use of remdesivir, uh, ability to better you know, position patients so that we're not uh, mechanically ventilating them as often as we, we used to. We changed our protocols to help with that. Um, all of those things have increased. But the other reason we're seeing more young people also get sick, uh, one is we're testing, you know, so we're identifying those people who were going undiagnosed before, um, including children. But the other uh, but the other is also that we everybody was in lockdown in the spring here in the in, in the United States. And now kids are out and about more. Young people are out and about more which means that they have more opportunity of getting sick. And so we're learning more about disease in young people. And so one recent, um, one, the, the, the onus, the, the largest um, severity of disease and mortality still lies with people who have medical comorbidities, who have medical conditions. Yeah? And, and, and the medical conditions are hypertension, diabetes, obesity, you know, immunocompromise of some sort. Uh, age is another one. And, and when, when in the U.S. only, and I can't speak, Portugal, but when you when you put it that way, most people say, "Well, that's not me." Or asthma is another one, right? Uh, pulmonary disease is another one. But but when you actually look at our population, twenty five percent of our population falls into that vulnerable group. Twenty five people percent of the population is at risk of just traditionally having high risk based on what we already know. And then we're discovering that there are people who don't fit that, who um, end up having a, a severe disease, and we don't yet understand why. It's a much smaller number of young people who don't have comorbidities, but I have seen enough and taken care of enough patients with COVID-19 who I don't understand you know, how they're sick. The, the thing to understand is obesity is one of the risk factors. 40% of the United States is obese. Uh, it, it's, it's mind boggling, right? And, and the other thing that I think is worrisome the picture is developing that there is probably something that this virus does that once you recover from it, even if you haven't had a severe disease, you may have some remnant um, remnant manifestations, what people are calling now long COVID. Um, and so, you know, if you survive this disease, we don't yet understand that's actually part of the research I'm currently doing. I'm, I'm doing a cohort of COVID-19 survivors currently to understand the, the, the immunolo immunological reasons why certain people develop this long COVID and others do not. Um, and so there's that risk, but then there's the cost of hospitalizations. In the United States, we've had 400,000 people hospitalized. When you're a hospital, you know, in the movies, you see these people get into car accidents and they walk out and they walk away. And if ever anybody's in a, been a fender bender, you know, that's a big deal. If someone hits you, that's it. You get injuries for the rest of your life, right? Hospitalizations are like car crashes. They're really hard on people. So we want to make sure even if people are not risk at, risk at dying, there are definitely more people at risk of being hospitalized who will carry that burden forward if they get the disease. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dr. Philip, uh, in Portugal, comment, this, this picture is similar about to, uh, go, no, regarding about mortality. It. Yeah. No, I, I think we, we can see different patterns of mortality in different countries. And I think the, the United States, it's a little bit different from most of the countries in Europe because of two things. First, we have public health systems, so we don't pay to go to the health system. And this means you don't delay when you need... Uh, medical uh, assistance, you don't delay because you don't pay. So you have private care, Medicare and private care in the United States. We have public health systems in most of the European countries. And this means a faster response to our patients. And second, as you said, it's not your case, of course, as you can see, the prevalence <laughs> of comorbidities like obesity are much higher in the United States than in European countries. And of course, obesity, it's a uh, um, it increases the inflammatory response, and so this increases severity. We see this, for example, in patients in in in, in Portuguese ICUs. But we uh, and I see a lot of COVID patients in my clinic, and we see a lot of long COVID. It's a fantastic word, by the way, long COVID. We use it in, even in Portuguese, long COVID, and uh, we see the patients need much more time to recovery than other diseases. But my question to you is another one because uh, we, probably we have, you have more conditions, more resources to, to research this. In asymptomatic patients 
What is your opinion regarding, uh, in long term, a higher prevalence of autoimmune diseases and neurological diseases? Some uh, scientists here in Europe, mainly from UK and Scandinavia, say that in a symptomatic, even asymptomatic patients can present later, 10 years from now, more prevalence of uh, autoimmune diseases and neurological diseases. What is your feelings regarding this opinion? Yeah, we've actually seen in our clinics, you know, in the acute setting, there's a lot of even patients who are not hospitalized. We have seen when they're sick, not even after they're recovered, but while they're sick, um, a few things. They've, they've had confusions. They've had cognitive issues. If, they've, if they have baseline autoimmune neurological diseases like, you know, myasthenia gravis, those conditions are worsened. So there's, that's in the acute setting. Um, Coincidentally, actually, my research is looking exactly at that. It's looking at uh, both inflammatory um, cytokine levels as well as autoimmunity in long COVID settings. I, I do think that what we're discovering, I mean, you only have to look at the children. So I, I will say I don't want to speak too much because we're hoping to publish something. And I, I until the analysis is complete, uh, which will be in the next couple of weeks, I don't want to speak to the results because I, I don't know them. Um, but but what we know already in children is the multi-system inflammatory sy the syndrome that's described in some children who have the disease but then recover later on. We know they have this condition that is um, you know the similar to Takayasu's and other sort of inflammatory responses in the in that group of children. The the there is already an identification of autoimmune antibody you know potentially playing a role of autoimmune antibodies and playing a role in that. So that's one component. Uh, one a part of our study is actually looking at cognitive evaluation. And we're already seeing that for many people, they're complaining about confusion, memory loss, you know, um, a lot of the issues that you might imagine that happen from a potentially a neurotropic or a virus that likes attacking the brain, which also we now have evidence that this virus does. SARS-CoV-2 actually has, um, has evidence that it, it actually crosses the blood brain barrier and affects the brain. The, the other thing that we know is there's a new study that just came out from NIAID, for, again, that showed that in 14% of the patients, they were able to describe what is causing severe disease. And part of what's causing the severe disease is that their bodies develop auto, um, autoimmune antibodies against interferon. Um, and so one of the, the proteins the body uses um, to help respond to the, to, the, to the viral infection. And so somehow when this virus infects your body, you, in response, it makes it so that your body creates antibodies or these proteins that then attack your body itself. And, and that's, that's the issue here. And so I, I, I think that we're going to probably find that there is greater and greater potentially an involvement of an autoimmune component to this. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Nahid Bakhali, we are, we are reaching the end of our, our interesting talk. Let me ask you one last question. How optimistic are you towards the, the, the evolution of this pandemic and the evolution of our behavior as a society towards to deal with this uh, pandemic? I am optimistic by nature, <laughs> even uh. though I feel that we have, um, you know, there's plenty of reasons why I should be, I should have learned my lesson. Um, I think the longer we live in this pandemic, I hope we come to the realization that the only way there was a wonderful, um, wonderful letter that was written by some of the British experts to the CMOs, the med chief medical officers in the UK. And they said that what we need to do is aim to live in this band of normalcy, 60 percent normal to 90 percent normal. That's how we have to exist. If we want to avoid lockdowns, we have to keep changing the way our freedoms, our social freedoms are, because we don't want to lock down. And and we don't want to overwhelm the health systems. And I think that the more and longer we live with this pandemic, I hope that we come, come together to that understanding of, of how we avoid the high risk stuff and try to still continue some level of normalcy uh, because the, we, what if the vaccine doesn't work out? If there's no efficacious vaccine, you know, it, we might, this might be a couple of years, not just one more year. Dr. Philip Freud, how optimistic are you? Um, I, I'm not a pessimist, neither uh, optimist. I'm a realistic, realistic. man. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, but I think we are not living normal days. We are living a normal days. This is the new normal. This is not the new normal. I don't want to live this new normal for much more time. We, we are living 
new and normal days and we need to return to normal days with the knowledge we learn from this pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope, first of all, uh, I hope with vaccines, and I think, first of all, the most important vaccine is knowledge. That's the, mm -hmm. the best vaccine for all pandemics for, and for most of the diseases. And in our days, we need to engage people to address the problems of prevention. And if we can uh, hold this situation until the vaccine, until uh, a new drug, some new drugs are, are, are coming, I th I'm realistic and I think in the summer of next year, mm -hmm. I think the problem, most of the problem will be over. And I hope to go to the sea Okay. And I need to go to the sea in next summer. So that's my deadline, to go to the sea <laughs> and to the sun and to the good weather in next summer, next year. Hopefully. Dr. Uh, <laughs> Roy, thank you very much. Dr. Nahid Bahelia, thank you, uh, uh, thank you very much for sharing this, uh, this wonderful presentation and your thoughts about this. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was my pleasure thank to you meet for having you. Me. E chegamos ao fim desta sessão. Well. Thank you, thank you very much. Chegamos ao fim desta sessão do mês da Ciência e da Educação, uma iniciativa da Fundação Francisco Manuel dos Santos, que continua na próxima semana. E nessa altura vamos falar da confiança que podemos ter na ciência, por exemplo, em questões de alterações climáticas. Obrigado.